Hello, this is Joseph Shore. I want to speak with you again about opera. This is not a new subject for me. I've been speaking about opera since before I made my debut <clears throat> so many years ago, back in 1974, with the Tulsa Opera and then the Santa Fe Opera. And I sang continually until 2006, when malpractice with surgery gave me an incurable lung disease which will not allow me to sing. Not because the larynx is hurt, it looks as good as a kid's, but because with this lung injury I can't get any air in to use to sing. We have a very interesting instrument physiologically. It has three parts. It has a power source in the heart and the lungs. Both of them must be strong in order for the instrument to play well. Then we have a vibrator in the larynx and we also have a transmission of sorts in the larynx and then we have uh, an acoustical resonating tube in the combination of the throat and the mouth together. I know you feel things in your head and maybe in your mask or maybe in your sinuses, but those little vibrations are much too small to add anything to the tone that comes out the mouth. So this has been proven time and again. So you can use those head sensations to validate that you're singing uh, in what we would call head registration, but don't try to scrunch yourself up to make more of those little vibrations. Be happy with the pure vocal track shaping that will give you the pure vowel. The pure vowel is one which is produced quickly and without overworking any part of the vocal organ. Just as it would work quickly if you were in danger. Hey! The danger provides the quick need for the instrument to work according to its need. And it'll do that. The same instrumentation and usage of the body, which early, early man, Homo erectus, used to warn his friends on the savannas that he saw uh, some beast coming over the horizon. That same mechanism is what we use in singing, and it works perfectly well that way. It is an analog instrument, and uh, uh, Richard Miller and uh, many uh, uh, doctors that have worked specifically on the neurology of singing, uh, Miller likes to quote Dr. W Dr. Wyke a lot, and Wyke has said, that singing depends upon a sort of a bunch of firing circuits, sort of like a software in the right temporal lobe. Your, your right, not my right. So right above the right ear, there is a an innate produced by evolution software that connects all the parts of the vocal organ. It connects the heart and the lungs to the requirements needed for uh, the larynx and for the vocal tract to quickly produce the sound that is needed. And that's why it's not digital. It's analog. It's mimetic. That is we learn it by hearing and by trying to duplicate the whole. 
So if you had, if you lived out on the savannas, you had a, you were not yet Homo sapiens sapiens, <clears throat> and you maybe had a couple or p, couple or two people living with you in a sm very small tribe or, or tribe at, and uh, you were looking out for one another. If you saw a saber-toothed tiger over the ridge and your friends didn't see it, you would have a need. Oh! 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 And you see, there would be no time to think, well, now how shall I place the larynx? How shall I shape the tongue? Uh, you know, you'd be dead by then. You would have been eaten. So the vocal organ evolved first as an organ of noise making, large noises, because the sounds on the savannas are very loud. This is my big dispute with some anthropologists who think that the voice evolved as a speaking voice first and better speakers evolved to be able to mate better. That is not supported by the evolutionary discussion about the musculature and the skeleton that we have. The muscles which are intrinsically involved in singing, but crucially for those high notes, are the sternothyroid are the sternothyroid muscles. And the sternothyroid muscles are huge, and yet they are not used in speech. Let me make that again clear. The sternothyroid muscles are not used in speech. Therefore, they could not have evolved for speech. There is no way about that, around that. Since they're big muscles, they had to evolve for some big need. And communication in an analog era before language would have evolved the need to make loud imitative sounds. <clears throat> because if you were with a small tribe, you might have been scattered out, say, 50, 60, 70 yards, as you're scurrying around looking for this or that, trying to gather or hunt. And you would have to be able to make a sound, a warning sound, that would easily travel 70 to 100 yards. <clears throat> I, I tell you for a fact, your speaking voice will not do that. Now, pop singers know that, so that's why they use a microphone. But I'm sorry, out on the savannas where we evolved, there were no microphones, except the given one through evolution. Oh, hey, hey, oh, oh, hey, my boy! Now, that is that sung voice, you see, comes out of the primitive noisemaker function. And it is a totally different setup in the larynx than in speech. We can go into that a little bit more in another video. Um, but I will warn you that people who advertise, I teach speech type singing. Avoid them like the plague because they don't understand the human evolution of the instrument of voice. When Homo sapiens sapiens discovered language, he created it like that. And he created it using an instrument which had already evolved to make loud sounds and noises. And he adapted it to make 
very small sounds, which were now symbolic. So instead of going, oh, we went, there's a tiger over there. It doesn't take much acoustic energy to say, there's a tiger over there. And we found out later that the left temporal lobe was evolving to make this kind of language possible. But until you had that, if you tried to use the, the warning voice, which is over here, with just your language skills, there's a tiger over there. See, your poor little speaking voice would not be able to carry. And if you try to use the speaking voice in a singing manner, you will be very disappointed. You will sound like a bad pop singer. And you will resort to using a microphone and to pushing your guts out. And then you'll call it pop music. That's exactly what will happen to you. Then you'll make a million dollars, and I'll still be sitting here talking to you. But you'll also ruin your vocal cords, and you'll have a career of about five years. So... We do not want to, to sing like we speak. In fact, those who spoke for a living, say in the radio era, the era of radio, if you got a job as a radio announcer or as a character in a radio show, say back in the era of Fibber McGee and Molly, when all of these dramatic shows that are now situational comedies on TV, they were first radio shows, many of them. And the people who were, who played the characters or who were radio announcers learned how to use some of the singing voice in a speaking manner, purely, uh, uh, some of the, let me phrase that again, they learned how to use the singing voice a little bit when they spoke their lines in order not to lose their voices so quickly. So, hello folks, here we are today on WQXR Radio, and now we come to the part where the red lion comes. That's using the singing voice in a speaking fashion, and radio learned how to do that. The reason, again, they learned how to do it was because using their speaking voice like this so much on radio uh, was not healthy, healthy for them. They would lose their voices. Also, the speaking voice has such a poor, a poor representation of upper overtones that it doesn't express much tone and characters on radio definitely needed tone to help uh, enliven and make their characters seem real. So forget about all those well-intentioned but uninformed teachers of singing who ask you to sing like you speak. Okay, forget that. So now this has been a little talk about anatomy. What I really intended to talk today to you about was personal responsibility in opera. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean this is only for opera singers. People who collect recordings are also a part of this this need we have for responsibility. You see, today, in good old United States of America, which could not give a flip about culture, it's an anti-cultural, 
anti-intellectual society. So no one gives a flip about culture. There's no department of culture, as some Europeans might have, a ministry of culture. You're never going to see that in America. So because we don't have that, we have to artificially create something that will do the same job. If we had a department of culture, all of the great operatic recordings that exist on Edison wax cylinder, on plastic, on the cassette, on CDDs, on DVDs, on Blu-ray, would have been collected and stored for history's sake in a cultural library for opera. So that people, if we still exist in 3019, long after opera is gone as a an artistic form in the society, so that people in 3019 could go back to the records, to the archives, and hear, and maybe even see from the videos collected, what this art form was. Because otherwise, I tell you frankly, my friends, in another 50 years, no one will remember the great art form of opera and what it meant to the world. Nobody. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you make a digital copy for yourself, not for selling to other people. You make a digital copy of your 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 uh, copies on on uh, cassette or on records, uh, maybe even a secondary copy of your CDs, and certainly of your if you have any old VHS videos of opera, make them into a DVD. Establish your own library of this material and talk about it with your friends who are also opera enthusiasts. Ask them to do the same of their collection and then make sure that you each will your collections to a collective source. Uh, maybe a, a part of the library in the community, uh, maybe some other private source. But we have to begin to think about how we will take the place of what the Ministry of Culture should be doing. And it's doing that in other areas of art. For example, we have the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the, all the other European countries have museums to house great paintings and great sculptor, great sculpting, and all other great forms of art except the visual ones. They need to be there too. So there's a, there are a variety of ways and places we could will our collections to. Let's make sure that we will will them to some collector, or some library, some place that will store them and make them on ability, uh, make them able to be accessed by people in the future. And if we do that, then the art form may even be able to resurface, to have a renaissance itself, even in a hundred or five hundred years. If we don't do this, it's very, 
doubtful that the art form will continue to exist or experience a renaissance in the future. We have to do this because no one who is a producer of opera today, no director, no producer, no uh, general manager is going to do this or care about it. Back in the early days of my career in the, in the 70s, the New York Times and many other places, Newsweek, many, art, many uh, articles were being written about the impending death of opera. Way back then, the New York Times was, had good reviewers then who sniffed this out, could intuit that it was going to happen. And as a result, a mini discussion took place within New York Opera about this. Um, I was talking to one of the big artists, one of the big agents. I won't say his name, but he represented my buddy Jerome Hines, and Hines was trying to get him to represent me. So I knew I could talk with him, frankly. And so I said, what do you think about these articles in the New York Times that says that opera is going to die out? And he gave me the most unexpected answer. I thought he would give me some answer of concern, like, yeah, gee, that's incredible stuff. We've got to do something. I don't exactly know what we can do, but we have to do something. I expected that kind of response of concern, artistic concern. Instead, do you know what he said to me? One of the big agents in all of opera. He said, well, maybe opera will die out. So what? I will have made all of my money by that time. And my mouth just hit the ground. It meant that he had no love for the art form that was in his soul. He was only in it to make money. I spoke with Nellie Walter, a, a major agent at Columbia Artist, about this very same thing. And she hung her head and she said, you know, I represented Leontine Price. We used to be the guardians of our artists. We led them. We helped them in their careers. And she said, now that's all gone. We are like grocers who dispense canned goods. And again, my jaw hit the ground because this was someone who knew what she was talking about. So I talked to somebody else in the business about it. Irving Gutman, Mr. Canada Opera. Irving Gutman, more than anybody else, brought opera to Canada and influenced it as an art form. So that, in fact, it is still here, although operating in ways that Irving would not approve of, and which he, dis he avowed his disapproval of before his death. I was having lunch with him uh, many years ago now, uh, here in Vancouver, and I asked him about this, the articles saying that opera was going to die out. And he said in his, he had the world's lowest voice, I cannot possibly imitate it. He made Jerome Hines sound like a tenor in his speaking voice. It was so low. But Irving said to me, well, you know, I myself couldn't even make a living just being a stage director. It's only because I'm a stage director and I run all these companies that I'm even able to make a living. And he said, 
You know, when I first started as a stage director, we all were looking for great singers who knew how to sing and knew the part. When we saw them in the audition, we were looking for someone who already knew the role and we knew he was intelligent and we knew we could quickly put him on the stage and if we wanted to change something this or that, we'd tell him and we knew he would do it because he already knew how to play the role and we wanted that. And then he said to me, he said, today, if any kid comes to the audition and has any ideas of his own about the character, that's the death knell for his career. And again, my jaw hit the floor. And I was aghast at what to say. And he continued, he said, yeah, these people running the companies today are so insecure that they really don't want artists anymore. They just want someone who can get through the part and who will do anything they tell them on stage. And that's not really working too well. It's not the opera that I brought to Canada. I swear to you, that was my last conversation with Irving Gutman, and that is a faithful representation of the words he spoke to me. So, I'm reminded of the fact, and Irving almost brought this up, <clears throat> that the people who run opera are not artists. They don't have an artistic soul. Usually, there are people who wanted to be artists, but had no talent. And maybe they even tried for a little bit and, and were thrown out because they had no talent. And instead of going off and making another career for themselves in something where they could have done well, like become a, a school teacher or an uh, a professor in a, in a university, something useful. Work in a hardware shop, for pity's sake. Instead, they became opera agents. And they became administrators of opera companies. And having no talent themselves, they were very, very backbiting and and jealous of people with talent. And oftentimes they would simply not hire the most talented person who auditioned, whoever that may have been, not just me. They wouldn't hire the most talented person who auditioned because of their jealousness, their jealousy about talent. They would hire some little guy or gal who was not very good and they would not make the artistic administrators uh, feel more insecure. Instead, they made them feel like they could push these, these poor singers around and the poor singers would look up to them with great awe and respect and they would make themselves feel better that they weren't out there on the stage themselves. And that became a kind of psychological trap where the most insecure people became in charge of opera. And if you live long enough with insecurity and deal with the world that way, you will develop into a very skewed, skewered, crooked person. I sang, one of the greatest honors I ever had sang personally was to sing for the great-grandson of Richard Wagner, Gottfried Wagner, who was a man full of integrity, full of talent. 
and uh, who has successfully produced opera many, many places. <clears throat> Pardon me. But he was thrown out of Germany as persona non grata because of his honesty in bringing it out to the public that the Wagner family contributed to the Nazis. They were Nazi sympathizers. They did accept Hitler. It was not an accident that Hitler used Wagner's music. He was actively helped in that by the Wagner family at Bayreuth at the time. And he explained, he, he told us how as a little boy his mother would come to him and say, Oh, children, put on your best clothes because, you know, Uncle Wolfi is coming to see us all. They called Hitler Uncle Wolfi. And they had the warmest, most cordial relationship with that sick tyrant. And as a result, Wagner's music became tied to the Third Reich. And Gottfried Wagner had made it one of his life's purposes to go around the world and redeem his great-grandfather's music, to apologize to the world as best he could for the role of his family in, in, with the Third Reich. And for doing that, he became labeled by the rest of his German friends as a Nespesmutze, which means a bird who fouls his own nest, a bird who poops in his own nest. And he was chucked out of Germany as persona non grata. He still went across the world doing his operas, continuing his relationships regarding public speaking, etc., etc. And he came here to, to uh, Vancouver to do a series of lectures for us at the University of British Columbia. And we in the School of Music were all a titter, all a buzz, because we didn't know what he was going to lecture about. We thought it was something intellectual. Maybe he was going to give us a lecture about the role of the trumpet in Wagner's music, you know, something erudite. We could imagine that. But instead, he gave us soul-searching truth about humanity, about the need for musicians to be honorable and honest and to be humanitarian in how we viewed the need and usage of music and the role his family played in the Third Reich. I sang for him. I did an audition. I knew he produced opera, and I wanted to have a chance to at least let him remember my singing and hopefully one day give me a call and say, you know, would you sing Tellerman for us and our new production of Lohengrin that we're going to be doing in Istanbul or wherever someplace? Because he did things like that. And he liked my singing very much. He was very, very complimentary. And I thought my, to myself, what other praises do I need now? That's fine. I, I don't need to see myself in any other quotation or print. With his approval, I think I passed my own test. But he said things beyond appraising my singing voice. He said that I might become a Elden tenor. He said my high notes were so good that I should keep singing anything that had high notes in it. And if that became held in tenor, fine. If it became just a high baritone, fine. But keep singing those high notes. And then after he said that to me, he said in a personal way. And there was one of my faculty colleagues sitting there right beside him. 
listening to him say this. So I have verification. And Gottfried Wagner said to us, he said, you know, I love the art form of opera. I love opera as an art form. But I cannot stand the environment of opera. Opera is controlled by this terrible, low, ignorant, hostile, even violent people. People who, if you saw them coming down the street, you would intentionally cross over to the other side just so you wouldn't have to speak to them. He said, so therefore, I have removed myself from the environment of opera. And that is why, my friends, we have no director or ministry of culture, and we have no person or persons within the group controlling opera who cares about making a lasting record, a lasting archive. Their only interest is getting rich and being in opera. They siphon off the money. They don't care about the art form. They will do anything which inflates their own ego or which brings money to them. They don't care if they if the people in the audience boo, they don't care how badly the singers sing, if they just take their clothes off when they're told to do so, or if they do the stupidest trick they can imagine, like put a space helmet and a space suit on you and have you sing Rigoletto from the moon through a space suit. If you'll do something stupid like that, then they'll cast you in their opera company. But otherwise, if you depend on great singing and great acting when you audition for them, it's like Irving Gutman said, that's the death knell. They don't want you because you're a thinker. And they don't want people that think. They want people who will be obedient robots to the conductor and to the stage director, and to the general administrators who are supposed to be the new stars of this new opera, which is not new at all. It is the destruction of the old opera. Think about that today, my friends, in beginning to create your own archive of great singing, great acting, great opera, which you put in your will to a source who you know will take care of it and make it public. That's my little speech for today. I hope it hasn't bored you.